Welcome to the first of four chapters where we'll focus on evolution. And this chapter is 19, Descent with Modification. Uh, before I zoom into the Prezi, um, let me just point out two YouTube videos that are linked to the Prezi, but I will not run while I'm talking. Um, and one is Dr. Strong's um, YouTube tour of the Galapagos Islands. She went there in 2012 and she narrates her experience there. And then down here is Bozeman Biology. Uh, I believe this is the Evidence for Evolution um, screencast. And again, you can go and watch his channel and I endorse everything he always presents. Uh, so if we go and uh, think about the organisms who um, exist on our planet, they are the um, descendants of many species who have gone extinct before them. They have acquired um, traits because their genes have changed, their expression patterns of their genes have changed, and for some reason they are the best at reproducing in their particular environment. And this guy apparently has great reproductive success. Um, I think we'll see some pictures of them when Dr. Strong narrates her thing. Uh, so let's go delve back into Darwin's life. He is the um, scientist, naturalist, who is accredited with the um, first um, description of evolution and natural selection and there are other people who contributed to his understanding and we'll we'll get to those as well. A couple facts about Darwin. Um, he was born and lived in the 1800s so again put yourself in that time frame. Um, we probably should consider him a naturalist. He was consumed with uh, nature. Thought he'd studied med school. Too gory for him. He didn't do it. He was a fairly wealthy family that he came from, so his dad um, wanted to try to find places for him to flourish, set him up to become a clergyman because he could then pursue his naturalist activities there. Um, he did end up going on to get married and raising a family, um, but he did go on the voyage of the Beagle that you'll hear about as their um, naturalist. He loved to read lots of books and they informed all of the things that he ended up writing about, especially Lyle's book, Principles of Geology. Um, that really told him and helped him understand and because of fossils that he found and other people found that the earth is incredibly old, not the 6,000 years old that the Bible would suggest allegorically, however, um, billions of years old and that things have changed over time. Um, so evolution could be described as descent with modification. We'll give some other buzzwords to think about, but those are that's a great um, description. Um, going now to his voyage of the Beagle, they left Great Britain. I hate it when that happens. And he um, then was on a basically their their charge was to map the coast of South America, and that's why you see that they spent a lot of time here. And um, then they they did spend a lot of time off the boat in the Galapagos Islands. In the inset here, they're off the coast of South America, very isolated. So you can imagine that organisms that landed there had a chance to um, to be appropriately matched to their environment. Ones that couldn't work out and that couldn't reproduce would die, and the ones that survived had mutations, carried mutations, carried traits, and made them perfect for their different islands. Um, he, Darwin came back and again raised his family, spent um, a lot of time at Down House, a beautiful estate that I've got pictures of I'll show you in class, and um, really ruminated on the, the things he brought back, and then finally took lots of notes and notebooks, finally published On the Origin of Species in 1859. Um, well, this is just an example, we're going to do um, an activity about the finches that are on the Galapagos Islands. They're, these fabulous collection of birds who are adapted to their different environments. Big differences in their beaks depending on what they eat. Um, and all. He, uh, Darwin saw them. They exist there today. They're studied actively today. They're a great example of um, changes and variation in a species. So I love this timeline. It exists from a previous version of the textbooks, but I, uh, I brought it up again here because I think it helps you always to set um, the scientists in their time. So Darwin's time is here in red. You can see it bounds the Civil War era. He was a contemporary of Mendel. However, they probably didn't ever speak to each other. They may have spoken to other scientists who spoke to each other. So there's a chance they would have known about their work, but probably not in the depth to have influenced each other much. Um, previous to Darwin, there's a couple of scientists who deserve discussion. Linnaeus, much, much earlier, again a naturalist, then 
what, think of what they had at the time for them to do their work with. Um, Linnaeus would be somebody who described what he saw. He's the father of taxonomy. He named a lot of things, and we still have a naming system that matches uh, or derives from his work. Um, we've just um, embellished it with what we understand now. Um, I told you that Lyle published a lot on ge um, geology, and he also informed Darwin about um, the age of the earth and other things like that. Lamarck deserves some discussion. He's brought up in your textbook. He, um, he did um, publish a word called evolution. He thought that traits were passed down to the next generation, and for sure that was correct. However, his mechanism was probably incorrect. He believed in the idea of use and disuse. So if a species did not use a particular trait, that it would not get passed down to the next um, generation. And on the opposite of that, if they overuse something like a giraffe stretching his neck to get food, then the subsequent generation would have longer necks. So we know now that, that just because you use or don't use something, that's not the reason why things get passed down to the next generation. However, you could twist what he said and say that the giraffe who was born with the longer neck, because he had the genes that allowed the growth, would get more food, and he would pass down his traits to the next generation. So he just didn't quite have it right, but his information did certainly inform the later people. The other guy to think about here is Wallace, and he's been getting a whole lot more credit now. Um, Mendel, I'm sorry, Darwin received a manuscript from Wallace that actually described all of Darwin's, many of Darwin's ideas about evolution and natural selection. Darwin freaked out, actually his wife freaked out and said, you better publish all this stuff that you've been doing, hanging around the house and putting in your notebooks and get to it and write your book. And exactly what he did the year after he got his, informa his uh, uh, letter from Wallace, he published his book. Um, it's been very clearly noted that Darwin's notebooks predate Wallace's um, work, but we need to give Wallace credit for also coming up with a similar idea without seeing Darwin's stuff, so he should be credited with something too. Here's a picture of Wallace. I know a little bit less about his history, so I can't spout on that right now. This is a picture from Darwin's notebooks. So he had this interconnected idea, this tree of life, that some organisms are connected to a common ancestor and they've changed and they've become new ones. We will be using those ideas a lot in the next couple of weeks. A couple of the highlights from the Origin of the Species book, he believed in descent with modification, so the next generation may have changes, and we know that's because you have a gene that makes you different. 99% of all species that have ever lived are dead. That's a product of the fossil record that you can see, that species were very different before, and now the new ones have changes. Natural selection is differential success and reproduction, so if you don't pass on your genes to the next generation, that population can't change. If you do pass on your genes because you have survived some thing in your environment, your offspring will have those genes. Uh, natural selection works on the variability that is inherent in organisms. We know that mutations take place. We know that DNA mistakes get, mistakes get made when DNA is copied. And now we even know about transposons that are sneaky and they introduce change without us even asking them to. And that's in the DNA. And then the product of natural selection is the adaption of population of organisms to their environment. So it's important to know that a particular individual may have changes, but you can only talk about adaptation of populations when you talk about species. And we'll get into that as we move on to. Um, here's just one, another one of these many um, relatedness diagrams, cladograms, phylogenies that we'll be discussing. Note that on this axis we have time. Um, if you make it all the way to the end, like these elephants, you are alive today. And if you go up here, the manatees are alive today. If you go back, you can see their ancestors, who maybe are, are uh, extinct. And you can look for traits that those ancestors shared and then may have adapted and become unique in the modern ones. Uh, it's a great picture to show you that there is a lot of variation within a species, and it is that variation that's the raw material for evolution. So maybe some years it's going to be really good to not have spots, and that individual will have high reproductive success and pass its genes on and more efficiently to the next generation. It's also interesting to remember that there can be artificial selection. Remember, you've been doing this all year in the lab with growing our, our plants. Love this picture because guess what? Your fast plants are part of this group. 
your fast plants were a hybridization or basically a selection, an artificial selection would be the proper way of saying it, from wild mustard. If you look at that flower, it looks just like our flowers that we're growing, very similar to our structure. Um, horticulturists have been artificially selecting for different traits, and we've gotten vegetables that you may or may not like to eat. I happen to like these guys. I don't mind the bitter taste of any of these guys. If you eat kale, it's a selected form of mustard that has wide leaves. If you eat Brussels sprouts, it's a selection from the cabbage plant to have smaller little cabbages hanging off a stalk. And broccoli. If you've ever seen broccoli grown in the garden, when it goes to flower, it actually looks like this. I'm going to cough, excuse me. <coughs> Hope that didn't blow out your ears. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Um, next, again, variation allows for survival of different insects. This is a great example of a leaf manatid that lives in Borneo, Borneo uh, on dried leaves. Um, this guy or his ancestors happened to have a change in the DNA that gave him this coloration, and they survived really well because they didn't get picked out as food from some, for maybe some birds or somebody, and that, that trait got perpetuated in the population. Similarly, if you go to Malaysia, those um, and to the related related insects to this guy happen to live on flowers. This guy's going to survive quite well. You can see his antenna there because he blends right into his surroundings and his variation has allowed him to survive there. Uh, you can go on and on with examples. Here's an example of the soapberry bug. He um, used to, in southern Florida, uh, when they're in southern Florida, they have a very long beak because it's needed to probe into this balloon vine berry um, and get the the food out that way. So if you look at typical museum specimens, they have an average beak size here. In an area where these um, fruits are prominent, the beak um, size increases. And then in central Florida, those balloon vines are not available, but instead this golden rain tree is available. And a long beak is not required, may not be as efficient in getting the um, juice out. And actually those bugs tend to have shorter beak lengths because it is better for them. So the short guys won. Bacteria resistance is another somewhat scary example of how change can happen. Bacteria reproduce very quickly, so their change over time is in a much shorter time frame. So MRSA is a strain of Staphylococca, Staphylococcus aureus. It's a bacteria that many of us have living on our skin, doesn't hurt us at all. If you get a lot of cuts, you get a lot of abrasions, maybe that staph could get inside your skin. Again, probably not a problem because your immune system handles it, but there are some aggressive forms. And this MRSA form, the MRSA form, stands for methicillin resistance. And methicillin resistant um, staph has been increasing in, in predominance just in 10 years. Look at how many um, hospital admissions have that resistant form of, of, uh, of uh, bacteria. How does the bacteria get resistant? Well, we actually put an ampicillin resistant gene in our bacteria in the lab. Not harmful like these guys because that bacteria doesn't grow on people. Um, but in, the, in nature, it's to the benefit of this bacteria to get a gene in it to survive. And these MRSA resistant ones have um, acquired a gene, whether it be by mutation or by taking it up from somewhere else, that um, makes them resistant to this methicillin, which is a step beyond penicillin, which was introduced in 1943. And uh, these genes can be exchanged on plasmids. We know the bacteria take up genes very easily, and it's been growing. Well, basically, you just need to have a couple of bacteria that survive in the presence of it, and they will be the ones that flourish. Um, this is a problem that's probably growing in our country more and more. Um, now it's time to kind of switch this similar gears, but to discuss about the evidence to support evolution. Um, we'll be talking about that basically for the next couple of weeks, but these are some very um, obvious um, visual things to support change and relatedness among species. So if you look at structures, we can find homologous structures, meaning that these structures um, in all of these mammals derived from a common ancestor at one point that had one, two, three, four, five, six different kinds of bones in the limb. If you go underneath the whale fin and the bat wing, you can find a similar pattern. So this is an anatomical similarity. 
um, to show homologous structures. There are things called analogous structures, and this just means that these species have managed to solve the same problem, but it is unlikely that they came from the same common ancestor that made that unique um, ad adaptation, so that same mutation. Um, the flying squirrel is derived from a North American species, and the glider, sugar glider, is actually a marsupial. He might look the same, he might be doing the same thing, but they did not derive from this trait from a similar common ancestor. Another um, piece of evidence that they, they go to a lot for supporting evolution, um, especially in animal kingdom, is to look at how embryos develop. So you kind of have to look underneath the, the skin or underneath the, the modern or the, the fully developed um, individual to, set, to see some similarities, and then they pop out. So if you look at the human embryo, it has pharyngeal slits or arches, um, so do chicks. And we also have a tail that ends up going away, and so does the chick. And if you look at the right times in embryo development, you'll see the remnants of these genes that used to express these um, structures um, before these different species um, evolved. And then lastly, you can look at fossil evidence. This is a description in the book about, and there are many different other ones we could use, about comparison of mammals and the even-toed ungulates, so those are the two two toes in the dog. Interestingly, they're going to follow the, the, I'm sorry, not crustaceans, the cetaceans. Cetaceans are the marine mammals, your belugas, your um, killer whales, and such. And um, if you look at the living cetaceans, who they their last common ancestor is, it actually is shared with the, um, you go back in time, it's shared with the hippopotamus, and um, you can also look at their bone structure in addition to just their toes. Um, I'm not going to get into those details. We'll use some other examples for those things as well. So again, I just went through some evidence for evolution. We did the fossil record, of which there are many other examples. Comparative anatomy, we looked at that. Comparative embryology. Uh, biogeographical distribution of species. Uh, that was the idea of the finches on the island. And again, we're going to find a lot more examples of those. And then finally, there's the molecular biology, which we'll be spending a lot of time looking at how related genes are. Um, we can now use the database of sequencing information to show how similar um, maybe human genes are to chicken genes or to um, chimpanzee genes or to very far away yeast genes. And um, you can then try to figure out um, where some different species um, branched off. Thinking about where the last common ancestor was, we'll be doing activities for that, and it's, I think, the most powerful evidence for evolution.